Some of the pranksters are on there sending other messages. So at some point, a message goes out, hit iceberg, now making way to Canada. But we know that Titanic never makes its way to Canada. About 1,635 people die on board um, as, as Titanic sank. So there was pressure on Congress to do something. So they passed the Radio Act of 1912. And now to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Liz Covart. Liz Covart is the creator and host of the wildly popular Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, winner of the Best History Podcast Award in 2017, as the digital projects editor at the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, Liz practices a blend of scholarly history, public history, and digital humanities. While the OI's primary focus is supporting scholars and scholarship related to early America, broadly understood, Liz experiments with social and new media to communicate scholarly history to large public audiences, which is what she'll do today. She believes if granted convenient access to the work of historians, the public will take an interest in history and become interested in it. Liz earned her PhD in history from the University of California, Davis. And when I would tell people that Liz Covart was going to be an opening keynote, it got people really, really excited. I don't know if there's anyone more beloved in the educational podcasting world than Liz. So please join me in welcoming her. Well, I'm really excited to be here. When I first started attending podcast conference, they'd be like, you have a podcast in history? It's not a business podcast? And they'd be like, no, I have a podcast about history. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to be amongst all of you who have educational podcasts or aspiring educational podcasts in, um, in mind. Now, I've been pondering a question for the last couple of years, and that's, what can the history of radio teach us about the present and future of podcasting? And I'm curious about this because if you read the headlines, podcasters invent serial podcast. Podcasters basically invented audio. Um, and I just like, as a historian, I'm like, no, everything has a history. Certainly podcasting comes from someplace else. Uh, and a lot of what podcasting has become is actually deeply rooted in the history of radio. Whether we know it or not, we've picked up on funding models, audio formats, and things that had already developed in the heyday of radio in the 1920s and 1930s. So what I thought I would do is give you a brief history of that history of the 1920s and 1930s in radio to show you where things like educational um, audio had come from and to actually talk about why educational audio never became a thing in the United States and where I think podcasting can fulfill this kind of lost promise of radio. And then if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about my story, um, which will be just one of many inspiring stories that you'll come across um, during this event. So the history of radio starts with this guy. I'm gonna butcher his Italian name because I don't speak Italian, but Guillermo Marconi. He was an Irish Italian man and he invented something called wireless telegraphy. Now you've probably heard of the telegraph, right? You know that it has wires, you can send dots and dashes over that wires and Morse code and send messages. And this was a huge thing, especially in the United States because you could send a message coast to coast. Well, what Marconi did was he revolutionized it. Now you could send those dots and dashes through the ether, the upper, the upper air, wirelessly. And this gets to be exciting in the United States because in 1899, no, he, yes, 1899, George Gordon Bennett, the publisher of the New York Herald, invites Marconi to come over and debut his device here. He wants him to broadcast the America's Cup yacht race in New York City Harbor. And he pays Marconi, offers him $5,000, which is the equivalent of about $152,000 today to do it. So the yacht race goes off, and Marconi's basically giving you a play-by-play -play with his wireless telegraphy device. Now, the wireless telegraphy device was really exciting to men like Bennett, because he's a newspaper man. You need news to fill your newspaper. Well, to get his news, he was using the telegraph a lot. Well, that cost a lot of money. So he was hopeful that having this device would add some competition to the marketplace. So what ends up happening is wireless telegraphy comes in. By 1901, you could send messages across the Atlantic wirelessly. In 1901, I know this sounds probably not as exciting as it was, Marconi sends the letter S from Cornwall, England to Newfoundland. And thus, now again, we have transatlantic communication that way. So it cost people like Bennett, newspaper men who use this device all the time, 10 cents per word. If you're just a business that, you know, or the government, you pay 25 cents per word, which doesn't sound like a lot, except that's about $7.62 per word today. So this is an expensive technology, but it's exciting. 
Now, Marconi always thought of it as a point-to-point -point communication device. You are a specific sender. You have a specific message that you'd like to reach someone else on the other end. He never imagined that he could use this to send voice or radio. It was just simply a wireless Morse code device. And this was OK because it left room for innovation. Two engineers, we have um, Lee, uh, Reginald Fessenden and Lee DeForest. Fessenden invented this device here, which is the alternator transmitter. It makes it possible to send voice wirelessly through the ether. And then Lee DeForest invented the Audion tube, which is that glass tube he's holding in his hand. And that allows the radio to receive the voice um, from the ether. And this kind of led, these technological developments led to the first radio boom. If you know a lot about history, you know that Americans like to speculate on everything, usually land, sometimes sports. There was speculation on radio. Between 1906 and 1910, Americans were basically buying stock in any sort of radio company they could, whether it was the American Marconi Company or engineering houses like Westinghouse that were producing radio-like components. It also got amateurs excited. If you think about like podcasting, we're kind of the equivalent of like the early DXers in the space. That's what they were called. Basically, you'd buy a DIY kit or the components you need for a radio, and you construct your own radio. This was particularly popular among middle class men and boys, white men and boys, because they had disposable income and the ideas that they should be engineering and engineering like. Well, they put together these radio sets, and the competition became how far can I send my signal? How far can I receive a signal from? And the further you could go on either end was kind of like a mark of your, uh, of your engineering prowess. The problem was as more and more people got into radio, the more crowded the airspace became. And this became especially acute after the invention of this, carbonundrum, which is a man-made silicon crystal. And you need a crystal to tune in the radio waves. That had been expensive to produce until they come across carbonundrum. And then all of a sudden, the price of radios and their equipment start to drop. Um, so by 1912, to give you an idea, the New York Times reported that there were several hundred thousand Americans on the airwaves. And what does that mean? Well, you could broadcast on any frequency you wanted. So you can send your dots and dashes through the ether. This is still slightly before voice. You could send your dots and dashes through the ether um, and, and get it to be heard, and you can tune in. So if the government's got something good going on, like the Navy or the Coast Guard, you can tune into their frequency and listen along. The government starts talking about regulations, and they do need to start putting regulations in place, especially by 1912. You might have heard of a ship called Titanic. Well, there hadn't really been regulations to make sure that you'd have a wireless telegraphy device on board your ship. Some countries had it, some countries didn't. Titanic, this supposedly modern, unsinkable ship, was cruising through the North Atlantic, making its way from England to New York City, going a bit too fast, and hit an iceberg. They start sending out the SOS and messages across their wireless telegraphy device. But this is how crowded the airspace was. As soon as people start hearing that the Titanic hit an iceberg, they start chiming in, are my friends and family OK? Some of the pranksters are on there sending other messages. So at some point, a message goes out, hit iceberg, now making way to Canada. But we know that Titanic never makes its way to Canada. About 1,635 people die on board um, as, as Titanic sank. So there was pressure on Congress to do something. So they passed the Radio Act of 1912. And basically what they said is, labor, the Secretary of Labor and Commerce, you are now permitted to license radio stations. If you want a radio station, you have to prove that you know Morse code, and then you have to prove that you know how to use your radio equipment. So you had to actually take a test and be licensed. If you're an amateur, they regulated you. You're no longer allowed, you could listen in on any frequency, but you can't broadcast on any frequency anymore. They relegate them to the short waves, the low end of the band width, 200 meters or less, which means you can't really broadcast too far and there's lots of interference, but this is where the amateurs are re uh, regulated too. And if you were caught on one of the bigger bandwidths that's operated by the US Navy or a company like Marconi, that could be a fine of $500 to uh, $2,500, which today is $13,000 to $65,000. So that's a serious fine, um, but that's what the government decided to do um, to bring order to the airwaves was they're going to regulate them. Now, the radio as we knew it came about because of this man, Frank Conrad. He was a Westinghouse engineer, and in 1916, he took out a radio license called KDKA 360 in Pittsburgh. 
You might have heard of them because they're still active today. In his garage, the station was licensed to his garage. He was just experimenting. He took a bit of a break during World War I. We went back to it after World War I. And he one day took his phonograph out to his garage, hooked up his mic, and basically started broadcasting music. So one of the very first music broadcasts goes out over KDKA 360. And Westinghouse is like, this is ingenious. I love what I hear. If we have content out on the airwaves, people want to buy a radio to hear it. And so what they do, they, they built Conrad a bigger station in downtown Pittsburgh, and he starts broadcasting all sorts of things, radio, sports, election results, news and information that people could use, and this created an opportunity to sell more radio station, you know, radios. But it also became something that educators looked to. Educators were some of the earliest innovators in radio, especially in terms of, of the technology and the programming. They start to think of this, okay, okay, if we can send voice and music out on the airwaves, surely we can send knowledge. So one of the earliest experimenters is this guy here. His name is Earl Terry. Um, he's from the University of Wisconsin, and he represents just one of the many educators who were experimenting by ra with radio. By January of 1923, there were 72 colleges and universities that had licensed radio stations because they believed in this educational moment. Well, what Terry does with the University of Wisconsin's radio station, which was 9XM, which is today WHA, um, he starts sending weather reports, at first with Morse code, but weather and market reports to the farmers around him. And he had quite a following because farmers need these market reports and weather reports so they know when to harvest and sell their crops. By 1919, he started experimenting with vacuum tubes. And by 1920, he was experimenting with voice and sending out voice broadcasts, again, usually with weather and market reports. And you could hear those all the way down in Texas. Um, so the power of radio is increasing. There were also a bunch of amateur radio experimenters living in places like Lafayette, Indiana, where you would find John Fetzer. He owned the radio station 9FD. And so this guy, um, president of Emanuel College, Frederick Briggs, um, goes down to Lafayette and says, hey, you know, radio's really hot right now. We love what you're doing. Why don't you bring your radio station to Emanuel College in Berrien Springs, Michigan? And we'll have students help you um, with your radio. We can teach them how to use the technology. And we can even have some of our professors put out educational programming over your airwaves. So men like Fetzer end up joining colleges, even if a college didn't have a radio station. Students were, colleges really want this because students were interested in the technology. And I think of that today when we talk about podcasting is there are some transferable real world skills that students could be learning. It was the same with radio. Colleges were also excited because you have men like Terry broadcasting market reports and weather reports to farmers who need them. And that's a mission of a land grant college is to support the surrounding agriculture and farmers of their state. But other professors saw it as an opportunity to broadcast their work to a broader audience. Have you ever heard of a MOOC, a massive on, open online class? Yeah, that started with radio in 1922. The University of Nebraska at Lincoln decided, hey, we're going to offer a class. We're going to broadcast it at a set hour every week. Um, and when we're broadcasting it, anybody can listen and learn from it. But if you want to pay us $12.50, which is the equivalent of about $183, you can take the class, we'll grade your examination, and if you pass the class, we'll give you two college credits for it. Well, people were really into this. It was so successful, lots of colleges and universities start adopting these radio courses. And the question became, though, if we're really eager to use this as a way to bring out our education, how do we do two things? One is, how do we continue to fund this? As we know as podcasters, radio content is free to consume. It is not free to produce. Same with podcasting. Podcasts free to consume, not to produce. So how do we fund it? The other question that came to be was, how do we as educational radio broadcasters compete with big time network radio? So to understand that, we really need to understand something about the rise of the National Radio Service. A lot of Americans believe that radio could be something that united the American people. Remember, we're a country that stretches over 3,000 miles from coast to coast, 
And you have farmers in Iowa wondering what people in New York City are doing, and people in New York City wondering what people in Louisiana are doing, and people out on the West Coast wondering you know, what's going on just along their coast, let alone the, uh, in the middle of the country in the East Coast. And people thought that they could create a sense of national identity if we had uniform programming that everybody could listen to when it was on. The problem was wireless telegraphy, the wireless technology, wasn't big enough, it wasn't robust enough at that point to support that kind of transmission. So the only way to get national programming from coast to coast was to do it along a wired network. And there was one wired network, AT&T. They had the telephone lines and they said, sure, you can use our telephone lines. We're happy to let you do it. By the way, here's your big rent bill. So then the question is, okay, well, how do you pay to get your content on the air? And it was decided that the most efficient way was to create a stable of high quality content programming that you could sell to advertisers who would support not only the production of the show, but the rent on the wires, and then hopefully generate some sort of profit. Because of the way that radio was funded with these sponsors, educational radio kind of took a back seat, especially after the passage of the Radio Act of 1927. The Radio Act of 1927 superseded the Radio Act of 1912 and basically created the FRC, the Federal Radio Commission, which was just the predecessor to the FCC. And what they did was, is they started giving preference to be, you know, of the better airwaves, the really strong ones, to network radio, you know, network radio, so your NBCs and your CBSs. And this was a problem because basically what happened is educators were relegated to a kind of a weak part of the bandwidth, and they were told that they had to share that bandwidth with other broadcasters, so you would basically be like, hi, University of Wisconsin, you're only allowed to broadcast Monday through Friday between the hours of, say, 1 and 3 p.m., and then the rest of that time would belong to some other group or um, educational institution. What happens to that MOOC? University of Nebraska having really big success, having this class out there that people are chiming into, that they're listening into and, and learning something. Well, the students start reporting that they can't hear what's going on. People aren't respecting these hours of broadcast. And other bigger stations are kind of butting into the airspace. So there's lots of static, lots of interference. And so what happens is, is a lot of educators end up pulling out of radio. It was expensive to operate a radio station. And by 1933, it would cost a college about $31,300 in equipment, which is roughly about $600,000 today. And that's just the equipment. Then you had to staff it. And of course, they do those things that universities do, where it's like, this department donates this many hours, and they're paying for it out of their budget lines. But just the radio budget line might be $10,000, which is roughly about $200,000 today. So when it became clear that they couldn't get their message out, the educational institutions start to pull out. Well, nonprofit foundations, I'm sorry, I'm just a couple slides behind here. But nonprofit foundations like the Rockefeller Institute, the Payne Fund, later the Ford Foundation would come in and said, nope, education is really important. We want it to serve the public interest. And they start organizing the educators to agitate for a new bill in government. And they get it in the Telecommunications Act of 1934. The problem was, it didn't really change much. There was a lobby from the big networks that said, well, you, the, these educational radio stations, they're agitating for 25% of the powerful dial. They don't really need that because we have plenty of time on our powerful radio stations to broadcast their content. And Congress believed them, so they didn't really change much. Um, educational radio doesn't really get a leg up. But the thing that changes is because the big networks made such a big deal about having airtime for educators, they actually had to pony up a little bit um, and pony up some of that, that airtime. But what the education, you know, what the networks want is to provide high quality educational content that they can sort of design. So rather than going to the colleges and universities, for the most part, to develop education, there are cases where they do, like with the Chicago, University of Chicago Radio Roundtable um, that, they, that, that the Rockefeller Institute funded. Um, but most of the time, they would just create their own educational programming. And we see this in the 1920s with the creation of NBC's Music Appreciation Hour with Walter Damrosch. Walter Damrosch was the conductor of the New York Symphony Orchestra. And he would get on the radio dial uh, on the station from on Fridays from 11 to noon. And he would talk about music and educate people about music. 
But this becomes a common theme for educational programming. They don't get the prime time spots. They don't get when people are listening. Think about what you're doing today between the hours of 11 and 12. I bet you it's not turning into the radio um, to learn something. It's, well, you're going to learn something because you're here today. But the thing is, is that's not something that masses of people do. So they really only are allowed to build up a limited audience. And to give you an idea is after World War II, the solution to educational programming and providing it is to subcontract out to the Canadian Broadcasting Company and the British Broadcasting Company um, and get their educational programming, which is state supported. And so by after World War II, by 1946, there's 50 hours per week of CBC and BBC produced educational programming broadcast on American airwaves. But again, it's relegated to these off hours, midday, midweek hours where not a lot of people can tune in. So it only had an estimated uh, listenership of about 3 million people. And we've heard podcasts who get more downloads than that. Um, so it's you know, not necessarily a whole lot going on. So in terms of why educational radio really failed to take hold in the United States, it had to do with limited space on the radio dial and a big regulation of that radio dial. And it's still re regulated today. It had to do with how they funded it. So if you um, want to get big sponsors for your show, it's a little different now because I'm thinking about podcasting, but for radio is you needed to have some sort of homogenized content that people were interested in that they could sell um, to sponsors, and that wasn't typically um, educational programming. But podcasts, I think, can hold, can fulfill a lot of this lost promise of radio because we're not as of yet, really regulated by anything. So anybody can have a voice, anybody can produce a show. As of now, server space is basically unlimited, and that's what you need to, to host your content in your, in your RSS feed. Um, so we're okay with that. So the, the space is wide open, and we can do a whole lot and inspire a whole lot of people, educate and uplift them through the power of podcasts. And I have a few minutes, so I'm just gonna breeze through my story quickly because, again, it's just, an example of what, of what one can do. So I finished my PhD in 2011 and decided I didn't want to be a professor. But I'd worked in the National Park Service and I had this public history bug. So I basically decided that what I wanted to do was write a lot of books and articles and kind of podcast on the side. I'd started listening to podcasts pretty late, 2012. I read about them in a book, like a good historian. And then I was like, whoa. I was basically learning skills I didn't learn in grad school, how to market, how to you know, organize things. I loved it, and then I went to look for a history podcast, but I couldn't find one I liked. And I understand, I'm a little bit of a niche market. I had my PhD in early American history. I wanted a show about early American history, and there wasn't as of yet one out there. And I didn't want you know, an overview. There's a lot of overview podcasts. I wanted something that went deep into the details, um, and yet was still kind of accessible. But I couldn't find a show like that, so I said, okay, I'm going to create a podcast. And then, like a good historian, I researched podcasts for 18 months because <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend it, but, you know, I was going to be prepared. But why the National Park Service thing is relevant is I worked there what I call during a magical time. It was between 2001 and 2005, and I basically saw the power of history when it's communicated well. In the fall of 2002, this guy, David McCullough, publishes this biography of John Adams. People started coming to the Boston National Historical Park, which is where I worked. And rather than asking me where Harvard, where Fenway, and where Cheers was, <laughs> they started being like, where did Joseph Warren fall in the Battle of Bunker Hill? How did the British burn down Bo Charlestown during the battle? How did the people of Boston even survive that British occupation between 1775 and 1776? All of a sudden, it's not like I had you know, bad times early on. I enjoyed my job. But the job got more enriching. I was really engaging people with history. And I'm like, this is great. And later, I would figure out through observational data and collection here, it was because of this book. Initially, people would be like, yeah, I read this book, John Adams. It was great. A year later, it was like, yeah, I didn't really like history. But then I read this biography of John Adams. And it was great. But my favorite was usually like, yeah, I used to really hate history. But then everybody was reading this book, John Adams, and I felt like I needed to read it, but now I love history. I mean, this guy, through well-communicated history, I know the book has some flaws, he created FOMO about history, fear of missing out. <laughs> this, was, this was great, so I applied to grad school to work with master interpreters and master writers. 
Um, as I said, I decided at the end I didn't necessarily want to be a professor, so I get into podcasting, write my books and articles, get into podcasting, start Ben Franklin's world. I thought that podcasting would be a good way to convey history just because of who listens. Um, these are like the Edison um, statistics about pod uh, listener growth, so there's lots of people listening, it's increasing. For history in particular, and I would imagine this similarly for educational podcasts, it fits the demo de NPR demographic. Our show has about 80% of non-historians listening, which is exactly who I wanted to target, the people I was meeting at the Park Service. Um, and lots of them are finishing the episode, so I thought it would be really powerful. I also had a couple questions inspired by my Park Service um, service, which is people keep saying people aren't interested in knowledge or history, but I didn't think that was the case because of who I was meeting at the Park Service. So I said, could podcasts help me answer this question once and for all, were people interested in scholarly history? And by that I mean the well-researched stuff, not the fluff, but the, the really in-depth stuff. And if they were, would they seek it out? Would they go to a historic site? Would they check out a book from their library or even purchase a book if they knew where to find it? And once I launched my show, it started in October of 2014. Um, I had 288 downloads. I thought that was great. I mean, 288 people in a room would be really impressive, right? But then it just exploded. Like within a couple months, you know, I was averaging 25 to 26,000 downloads a month, and I was like, oh, this is, you know, all of a sudden, sponsor interest. Um, I don't know what to do about sponsors. You know, you probably hear from people. Sponsors are a little bit complicated. I'd get notes from colleagues like, can I be on your show? And I was a little confused by that because it was like, it might not be a good fit, but how do I tell them no when I'm going to see them at the next conference? So I had a lot of business side of history uh, questions, and I reached out to the Omohundro Institute, which is the Institute of Early American History and Culture. They've been producing the journal in the field for years and some of the best works. And I knew that they supported scholars and scholarships, so I just kind of randomly emailed a person I knew over there, the director, and I just said, hey, I have this kind of crazy project with business side of history problems. Do you think we could talk over lunch? And what that led to was a really fruitful partnership called Doing History. It's a series that's actually right now running on the podcast, and it's about showing the process of history. Listeners weren't just interested in history. They wanted to know how historians do their work. So right now we're running a, an, a series on biography. What is biography as a genre? If people are using it as a gateway to history, what, what is it designed to do? Why are we so into it? Why can it open up the past? And so we're exploring that in four episodes. In our first season, we explored the process of how historians work. How do they research? How do they write? How do they interpret a historical source? And we found these episodes were really popular with listeners. So while we normally offer interviews with historians, um, in these, this specific series, we are talking about process. And it's been exciting because your podcast can be more than just a podcast. I believe that the future of scholarship is multi-platform. I believe that it's going to be a collaborative space. And I believe that if you have a podcast, you can drive people to a book. If you have a book, you can drive people to a blog post. And if you have a blog post, you can drive people um, to an app or even someday virtual and augmented reality apps. And we're playing with this at the OI. So the first side is one we partnered with a cultural institution and we, that's an interactive graphic of the Declaration of Independence. We do have our podcast and of course we connect it when we can with the William & Mary Quarterly um, which has been the journal in the field for the last uh, 20, uh, 75 years. So I do think um, the future is bright and it starts, it can start with a podcast, but it's going to be more, even more multi-platform than that. So that's where I'm going to leave my story. If we catch up, I can tell you about it more in detail. I encourage you to ask others about their stories too, because not only if you're a veteran or a newbie is it inspiring uh, to find out how people got into podcasting and what they're doing with it, but it's also a great way to learn and to figure out new tricks about how to podcast, what's working in a science podcast that could work in a history podcast and vice versa, um, or even other subjects. So I do, because I'm a nerd, I have a free bibliography about all the stuff I've collected on the history of radio that I, I couldn't even get into. And if you text um, OI News to 33444, you'll get that. Um, and you can also sign up for the newsletter to keep up on the podcast and whatnot. And then, of course, my email. So thank you very much on that whirlwind tour.